October of 1936, around 100,000 residents of the East End of London petitioned the then Home Secretary, John Simon, to protect their community from invasion by the British Union of Fascists. Instead, Simon sent over 6,000 police officers to protect Oswald Mosley's mob of over 2,000 fascists and to break the blockades the locals had installed. The Eastenders, who were predominantly Jews and Irish Catholics, hadn't just petitioned the Home Secretary for help. They had also reached out to their religious leaders and the Labour Party. However, help was not forthcoming and it was only after persuasion that the local Communist Party decided to help with local organising efforts. The local residents were not easy bedfellows, they had their own disagreements and clashes, but they understood that a threat to one part of the working class was a threat to all. Class solidarity came above their disagreements, and this was displayed in their long-running rent strikes and prevention of evictions. One story goes that local communists had prevented the eviction of known fascist sympathisers. When asked why they did this, they said simply that they will change the bad politics of these people, they will work to change their minds. But still, the authorities had no right to make a family homeless. Not on their watch, not on their streets. And so, when the almost 10,000 strong army of fascists and their police bodyguards descended upon the East End, they were met with over 20,000 working class anti-fascists. A tram driver abandoned his tram to block the way of the mounted police officers. Women emptied chamber pots onto the marchers' heads. Children threw marbles at the police horses and thousands of people used whatever means they could to drive the fascist army back. And despite hundreds of injuries and dozens of brutal arrests, drive them back they did. Within weeks, the leader of the London County Council, Herbert Morrison, a Labour politician who would go on to briefly become leader of the opposition, moved a motion at the Labour Party conference condemning the fascists and praising the actions of the local communists. The end. Just kidding. He moved a motion to condemn the communists and said that the opposition to Mosley's mob was just as much to blame in a spectacular early edition of both sidism. By the end of the year, the British Parliament had passed the Public Order Act of 1936 which, on the face of it, was designed to ban the use of political uniforms in public, Mosley being a fan of the black instead of brown shirt. However, it also prohibited equipping persons for the use or display of physical force in promoting any political object. And of course, it was almost immediately wielded against working class activism all the way up to and including the miners' strikes in the 80s. The Battle of Cable Street is pretty well remembered as a successful pushback against British fascism, and it was a significant victory. But the reason I'm telling you about it today is those anti-fascist heroes who, because of the world war against Mosley's particular branch of fascism, which would follow, were lionised as a part of British heroism, they were the ones breaking the law. Mosley was the one with the permission. Mosley was a member of established British politics and who knows how he would have been treated had history not unfolded as it did. We don't even need to imagine how the use of violence against fascist groups would be taken now, or even any illegal activity designed to protect vulnerable communities. Police officers who were there that day would deny my accusation of being Mosley's bodyguards. They would say that they were there to keep the peace between two groups who they knew violently opposed each other. However, still in their eyes, it was the local residents who were the agitators of the situation. Mosley had a right to march, they would say. And this ignores the fact that the local residents did petition their political leaders and were ignored. A choice was made. 
which side was legal and which side was illegal was decided. It's all kind of complicated systems of government and legislation. Probably say that most people don't really even know the ins and outs of how law is made on a national level, let alone an international level. It doesn't really sound very fair that like people at the top can just like do a thing and then there's a law and you have to follow it or else you lose all your freedoms. But then we do want some rules, don't we? Otherwise it would just be an absolute nightmare. We might say that Rosa Parks breaking segregation laws was the right and moral and noble thing to do whilst also seemingly to really struggle applying that to modern day acts of rebellion. This confusion and lack of moral absolutism presents a problem for the powerful at the top who really want you to think that it's absolutely the right thing to do to follow every rule that they set for you or they just would not have set them, you silly boots. But like, is it? In philosophy, a moral obligation to follow national laws is called political obligation, and it's contested. Problematic, as the kids would say. But philosophers will philosoph, and the ones who are clearly the biggest nerds have tried their hardest to provide a logical and moral justification for universal political obligation i.e. a reason why always following the law is the right thing to do. So let's have a look at what they've come up with. Knox. <coughs> Argument the first. Consent. So the basic idea here is that citizens are obliged to follow the law if they have consented to do so. And so we must find reasons to believe that all the citizens of a country have given their consent, either explicitly or otherwise. One very serious suggestion by very serious philosophers is that if a person lives in a country and doesn't leave, then they have consented to rule. Anyway, David Hume destroyed this argument in 1752 in his argument on the original contract. He gave the example of an unconscious man being carried aboard a ship and being taken out to sea. Did he consent to the rule of the captain by not jumping overboard and drowning? Somebody just born into a nation without the option to leave can hardly be considered to have consented to the rule of its leader explicitly or not. Most people thought that was enough to put the silly old consent argument to rest, but no. Some said that, all right, staying in a country could be considered consent if and only if citizens have the freedom to leave. Boom, mic drop, take it to the bank, case closed. But like, freedom to and ability to are different things. That's like Bon Chaporo saying that flooding victims should simply sell their homes. So then philosophers were all, well, pe people do stuff when they're living in a country and we could say that doing certain things like um, making use of state-run services, that's, that's them giving consent right there. Yes, that Active participation in state-ran institutions and services incurs obligation, like voting in those elections we let you do. Checkmate. Game over. I rest my case. Done and dust. But like, first, if you think that voting in an election incurs an obligation on your part to consent to rule, then it follows that you would think that a minority group voting against a leader who would do them harm, by doing so, they have then consented to any harm which befalls them should that leader win. Voting against a thing should not incur a moral obligation to adhere to that thing. But if we take this account of the argument from consent, then a leader would be morally justified in hurting those who voted against them. I actually saw someone on the left 
say something like this recently, that by voting in the US election at all, you are consenting to neoliberalism. But when we consider how pathetically weak our voting rights are, you really want to make that take? Voting as it is, is showing a preference between options. It does not incur consent to all that follows. And secondly, on the point of active participation in state-run services, can people just refuse the services which are provided for them? It's often illegal to refuse education, for example, and could we really expect a dying patient to refuse life-saving care to avoid some political obligation? Or for someone to refuse to use the roads or drink the water? If the choice here is stay alive and give consent or die and don't, I'm not sure that's a meaningful choice there, me dudes. Okay, let's be fair. The reason why people like this idea is because on a small scale it kind of works. For example, if you live in a dorm and you have a shared kitchen, it would be perfectly reasonable to say, if you use the kitchen, you have consented to help clean the kitchen. But applying it to a nation or a society, it's all very... Argument the second. Fair play. Following on from the dorm's kitchen analogy, ugh, student kitchens, there are some who say that the reason why we all have a moral imperative to follow the laws is because a democracy is a cooperative enterprise. Every participant of such an enterprise is sacrificing a part of their autonomy to do so. And a cooperative enterprise demands cooperation. Therefore, participants have a right to expect that others will fulfill their obligations. We do like a bit of fairness, don't we? But often, as we can see through the very need of conflict resolution, what is fair isn't always easy to agree upon. If a minority group feel that they're being treated unfairly, unless the dominant group agrees that Yes, actually, that is unfair. The minority's autonomy will always be trampled on and others will never fulfill their obligations towards them. And also, what of these democracies? Are they cooperative enterprises? It seems like proponents of the fair play argument have predicted such a question because while reading them, I was struck by the really heavy use of the words reasonably just, as in, the fair play principle would only apply in a nation which was reasonably just, because it would be ridiculous to call a dictatorship a cooperative enterprise. But one, who gets to decide how just the justness is? Like under a proper dictatorship, people can be brainwashed within an inch of their lives. And geez, even under good old-fashioned liberal capitalism do we have false consciousness. It seems clear that if you get a worker to believe that they're just a temporarily inconvenienced billionaire, then they're quite likely to believe that the existence of billionaires who easily could but choose not to and most of the world's biggest problems is reasonably just. If you're interested in learning more about how easily people's judgments of things can be manipulated, then watch part three of my Alienation and Identity series. But if TLDR, it's super easy and it happens all the time. There's loads of things I could say about why your average state isn't exactly cooperative, not to mention how they are usually conceived in the first place, either through military force or political shenanigans. But some may still say, Well, look, the state does provide benefits. That's a part of cooperation, surely. And that's now, not hundreds of years ago. But there are issues to be had with the idea that the mere provision of a benefit incurs obligation. Artistic people in the audience who don't like the custom of gift giving, you get me? 
Imagine if your community started up a radio station that broadcast cool and relevant content direct to your ears. You like it, you listen to it, but the thing is your community's decided that you have to host on a particular day. Do you have a moral obligation to do so? Just because you've listened to the radio station from time to time? Would your neighbours be justified in cancelling you if you didn't? Another important point against the idea that the mere provision of a benefit should incur an obligation is that there is a big difference between receiving and accepting. Having a supposed benefit just foisted upon you, only to then be burdened with an obligation, that's like movie and mafia type stuff, isn't it? Like, oh, we're, we're protecting your business from us, so, so you better pay up, buckaroo. Mafia say buckaroo, don't they? I did not put buckaroo in the script. Disabled activists are constantly having to fight against charities and foundations who are actually hindering with their help. Or against the constant stream of funding that's going into like super complex technological wheelchairs that can climb stairs and fly and hover and shit when they've just been crying out for like more accessible infrastructure please. The motto, nothing about us without us, is a good reminder of the difference between receiving and accepting. Argument the third, membership. Finally, another popular argument for universal moral political obligation is that simply being a member of a group incurs obligation. You might think this sounds similar to the other arguments, but the point here is that political association, like family or membership, is itself pregnant with obligation. So the moral obligation to follow the rules lies in the simple truth that the nature of political association is like being a member of a family. And this kind of membership, we have already agreed, involves a level of obligation to one another. Proponents of this argument say that membership of a state involves a sense of identity which goes along with it, a, a belonging and connectedness. And there are similarities between a state and a family. Um, we're, we're born into them without choice and they do tend to involve authority and obligation. But we've also kind of collectively decided that families are a good thing, so you can see why politicians love to invoke this concept. The household budget analogy for government spending being a particularly pernicious example of this. I'm not here to say that if you've ever felt a sense of belonging to your home state or that you hold your nationality as part of your identity, that's a bad thing. I actually think it's a darn shame that these days you get thrown in jail just for saying you're English. But there are problems with the argument from membership, as you probably guessed by me telling you about it. Firstly, family bonds typically involve some level of love and caring for one another. And that doesn't typically tend to be the relationship we have with our political leaders, no matter how hard their propaganda efforts try to make it happen. We're just not that into you, weird dictator dudes. And even if we did love our dear, dear leaders, that only opens up the problem of paternalism, in which the citizens of a country play the role of the kids not equal and autonomous members. People do not enjoy being infantilised by the state and will rebel against attempts to nanny them, even if it is for their own good. And even if we loved our dear leaders and loved being the kids in the relationships, let's just say, for the sake of argument, that a state is exactly like a family. Is the sense of obligation that comes with being in a family real, actual obligation? The kind we might call universal? I mean, just because we sense something, that doesn't necessarily mean much. Someone suffering from Stockholm Syndrome might sense that their captors care for them. And if we think about it, even for a second, familial obligations are not universal things upon which we've all agreed. 
every family is different. Even what we consider to be a family can change drastically. It can be one person and a cat to a household of 10. And how much obligation is involved depends on each family too. Are the children of abusive parents obliged towards them? Am I obliged towards distant cousins I've never met? And if so, how much? And we can't just look at standard definitions of the word family either, because that might not include your grandparents who live in a separate house, and it might include most humans on the planet through DNA relations. Sorry if the light is suddenly a bit different. It's taking me way longer than I thought it would to film this and it's getting dark. I'm almost done though, I promise. So anyway, I was saying, family, bit vague. It seems to me like trying to make a state like a family, it just raises more questions than answers. And yet, these philosophers persist. The state could be thought of as like a family if it provides the generic good of order and security. Honestly, I'd say it's a bit rich to call order and security a generic good. And even generously. Order for whom? Security how? How much violence will be needed to enforce it? Should we sacrifice our liberties for it? And what, pray tell, is stopping the state from just manufacturing a sense of insecurity only to then provide security from it? And let's be honest, Obligation in exchange for security all sounds a bit feudalistic to me. Conclusion. After reading arguments for political obligation, you start to notice that the proponents of them seem to have to create some kind of utopian hypothetical state which does not nor ever has existed in order to make their arguments even seem like they work reasonably just. Any kind of top-down power structure is going to decide what reasonably just means in a top-down manner. And it follows on from these arguments that the kind of society we would need in order to have any semblance of universal political obligation would require direct democracy in the very least. And even then, if there is still a hierarchical leadership structure, then decisions aren't going to be made democratically. The options for the ballot will not be democratically decided. And it seems to me that if philosophy ever did come up with a foolproof reason why it's an absolute moral imperative that we must always follow the law, then I believe that we risk moral philosophy justifying authoritarianism. I'm looking at you, Hobbes. So what am I saying? You shouldn't follow the law? No. 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 There are important and very easily justifiable reasons to have rules in place and to expect that others will follow them. One basic reason is they provide a social cohesion which is needed for the happiness of people to operate within society freely. It would be frightening to think that anyone could just do anything to you and that would infringe upon your freedoms. Ultimate freedom is impossible due to the very nature of how our actions have consequences for others. By now you might have noticed that I've said the words freedom, hierarchy and top down a few times. Now I wonder why I might be doing that. I believe that instead of doing a load of complicated mental gymnastics trying to find reasons why citizens are obligated towards unfair states, we should be using our brain skills on trying to find ways to make society fairer. Instead of trying to justify coercion with complex ethical theory, we should be working on replacing coercion with consensus. Political anarchists argue that hierarchical state leadership structures are illegitimate. They cannot be justified. I have presented to you some of the strongest arguments for the legitimacy of state power and every single one of them fails when applied to existing or historical states. And every single one of them seemingly needs to present a hypothetical state which I think comes closer to anarchist conceptions of organisation to even make their arguments seem as though they work. The more decentralised and laterally organised a society is, the easier we can justify obligation to follow its rules. 
This should tell you that anarchism isn't some pie-in-the-sky utopian dream, but it's a very serious answer to some very serious problems of the legitimacy of hierarchical organisation. But there may always be injustice or rules in place that hurt people, no matter how society is organised. And that's why rule breaking should never be seen as a bad in and of itself. Imagine if for whatever reason World War II had never happened. That the UK was never galvanised so strongly against this very, very specific branch of fascism. Would we now be looking at the men, women and children who fought on the streets on Sunday the 4th of October 1936 as paving the way for Britain's stance against the rest of them fash? Do we even? While researching this, I found a clip of an interview with a police officer who was there on the day, taken 50 years later in 1986, one year before my birth. In it, Tom Wilson recalled the events from his perspective. It was obvious that both had set out with the intention of doing what they wanted to do, and that was the fascists, the Mosleyites, the black shirts, were intent that they were going to have their right, which one says if it's going to be peaceful, is to march in demonstration through the East End. And the opposition, which was largely communist inspired after all this time, I mean, one's memory is a little bit vague at, in, in the general sense, but that is the impression we all got, that it was largely communist inspired and that they were intent that Mosley would not walk through the East End. And uh, my resentment was against the fact that a mob were going to try and take over and do as they liked, irrespective of what the law said or what the authorities said. And uh, today, I still take that view, that no one should be allowed to be above the law and everybody should be made to obey the law. And I consider that the people of this country are very lucky insofar that they have so reasonable a police force uh, in, in mass. I don't know a police force in the world that is more fair or more just. I would have thought from memory that it wasn't just the Jewish people and it wasn't just the communists. I thought the average decent people had no time for black shirts. Those who were alive at the time might view the rise of British fascism in an entirely different light to what following generations did. There are interviews you can listen to taken by the same correspondent of members of Mosley's party. They talk of unemployment, an uncaring state and exhaustion from international conflict. But because of what happened since, later generations have categorised those fascists as an obvious evil, one which you can spot coming a mile off. And anybody who fought against that is a hero by definition. And yes they are. But when will this cycle stop? Allowing our institutions of media, education, law enforcement to lionise those anti-fascists, to call those lawbreakers, heroes, to use their images, their words and causes as marketing tools and ways to mask over a lack of progress. While at the very same time, whenever a marginalised group now gets ideas of righteous rebellion for change, we're reminded over and over and over again that nobody is above the law but honestly if you're gonna come at me with a claim so bold you're gonna have to back that up and i don't think you can so rise lions <laughs>
Virginia, Virginia.